Hey guys, it's Trish from Mangtas. Don't miss great tech stories from our guests and our hosts, Jackie Nimink and Wato Delbare. Only here at Mangtas Nation. Welcome to Mangtas Nation Season 2. This season is all about tech of the future. We'll be sharing real-world experiences and featuring astounding guests to help guide you in your tech journey. Are you ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. I'm ready. The show starts right now. Hello, everyone. Here's to another day of bringing about and learning, uh, learning and inspiration from tech stories of today's star of the show. Our guest for today is the Global Communications Manager of Generation, which is the largest global employment program that trains and places people into life-changing careers. He is interested in the intersection of education, policy, and technology, and his current mission is to prepare people for the future of work. Listeners, the Young Leader of the Year by Revista Carriere, a member of Forbes 30 Under 30 list, and the Young Strategic Leader by the Aspen Institute. Let's welcome David Timmis. Hi, David. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much for the invitation and the very good pronunciation of Revista Carriere. Excellent (laughs) Romanian skills, uh, Jessalyn. So so thank you for the the, uh, introduction and pleasure to be here with you. Well, to be honest, I actually looked that one up, David, and even asked my husband because he has colleagues from Romania. (laughs) So... (laughs) <laughs> but it's great that I pronounced it correctly. So, well, before anything else, uh, David, and again, welcome to the show. Just tell uh, our listeners a little bit about yourself, please. Um, I guess professionally, you mean, or personally, where I come from, more? Or, uh, yeah, okay. You can you can start with the personal side, and then veer slowly to the professional side. Sure, sure, happy to. So, I already sort of gave my nationality away. I'm originally from Romania, from beautiful part of the country called Transylvania, which uh, was actually named by the Financial Times the Tuscany of the East, because it in- indeed has some of the, the same um, assets that make the beautiful region of Italy, Tuscany, uh, also relevant in Romania and Transylvania, the small villages, the welcoming people, and the, the amazing traditions and culture there. Um, lived my first 18 years of my life in Romania, but then I left, like many other Romanians, um, you know, to, to live abroad, to study abroad, to work abroad. Initially in Scotland, where I did my, my first degree. Um, then in France, uh, I completed my second degree. And uh, in Belgium, where I finalized sort of my, at least this part of my education, the more formal one uh, in, in, in Belgium. Um, and my background, since I mentioned education, is at the intersection between business and management, and, you know, specifically marketing and communications that specific part of it, and public policy. That's the sort of last degree I've done in Bruges at the College of Europe. It's focused on European European political governance studies, uh, in other words, politics and how the EU works. And and I try in my daily work and life to combine the two passions of communicating, but also being close to policymakers and following all the debates, especially the ones to do with the digital regulations and, and, you know, digital policies. So I'll stop here because uh, I think uh, I, I sort of covered a bit of the personal part and we'll probably talk more about the professional one later on. But I wanted to stop here for now. And I have immediately have a couple of questions because uh, Jackie is originally from the Philippines, but currently lives in Belgium. Um, and I'm originally from Belgium, but currently live in Singapore. So, uh, I, so did you mention Bruges? Is that where you studied? I studied in Bruges and uh, I'm living in Brussels now. So indeed, it's a funny uh, triangle here we have uh, <laughs> of people who have obviously something to do with Belgium. Uh, you know, I, you left it. Uh, I, I came here, Jacqueline the same. So Brussels and Belgium connecting us all in a way. And and Wouter, it's also good to note that David also played football. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, oh, yeah, that's for uh, Jackie and myself as well. We were we, in the Philippines a long time ago. Uh, we were, Excellent. I was on the men's team and she was on the women's team of our Obviously. university. <laughs> 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 Nothing changed. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, David, tell, uh, after after a bit of your personal story, tell us a little bit about what you currently do as the Global Communications Manager of Generation. 
in a nutshell, I, I uh, represent the organization externally, be it in uh, you know press releases and other sorts of uh, written communications or sort of on social media, but also more and more now that the pandemic is more or less behind us, at least in Europe, in, in events. Um, and by representing, I mean I speak about the great work that my colleagues are doing on the ground with you know uh, with the vulnerable people across the world, because our purpose as an organization is to help vulnerable individuals of all ages across the world to, to find meaningful work, which is something so uh, difficult to do even for people who have opportunities in life, but it's obviously even more difficult to, to achieve as an objective for people who are less fortunate than, than, than some of us. So that's our goal. And in my role, I, again, communicate about the great work my colleagues are doing and, and be a good representative for the organization I'm, I'm part of. Wow, that's just beautiful. And for people who don't actually know what Generation does, so you do, you know, you help the underprivileged and uh, you reskill or teach them new skills. How do you actually go about doing this? Yeah, so Generation started off initially um, 2015 as a social impact project for the um, consultancy firm McKinsey and Company, and it was initially a, a project within the organization to to try to figure out as a main goal initially, uh, you know, how to bridge the gap between education and employment, because and this doesn't pertain to vulnerable or not so vulnerable for everybody. We all have faced with have been faced with the challenge of how can we apply what we've learned in school in the labor market, which is hard to do even if you've been you know at the top university and if you had the chance to go to university in the first place it's not always clear that education formal education prepares us for the line of work uh, or does so efficiently um, and that's the idea where, where generation started and over the years we've obviously gradu gravitated towards becoming our own independent ngo which we are now still having mckinsey and other you know large organizations like google and microsoft as as partners as funders but we are independent now, and our focus is to, as you mentioned, reskill people, so train them in, in um, skills that are sustainable. So in general, tech is a very sustainable industry, so we prepare people in tech, healthcare as well, uh, green jobs more, more, more recently. And we don't just prepare people, we don't just reskill them, we also help them in finding employment. And again, sustainable employment, meaning that we're looking for people to work in organizations that give them a... Uh, you know, good living wage and, and the opportunities to develop. And to make sure that that happens, we actually stay and support the learners, as we call them, uh, our graduates when they get the job. So we, in a nutshell, we have actually more pieces to the puzzles, but the key three ones that I mentioned is we reskill, we employ, and we support people. We offer them support uh, after they get employed. So, you know, a holistic approach to the future of work, as I like to call it. Wow, it seems that you're doing something very noble there, David, and I uh, you know we salute you for for doing it. And uh, you also mentioned that, yeah, you there like the tech, the tech uh, area is uh, a common um, a common uh, industry where you you upskill um, the the people that go through generation. But how do they actually find you, or do you like reach out to them or? Mm, like uh, hold events or like, you know how they have job uh, job fairs or, or something something uh, of those sort it's a good question i think uh, it's a mixture of both uh, so people find us on our site and we have quite a few individuals from across the world who write us to that you know they want to join the programs we offer but unfortunately we're not yet in their country and we're obviously redirecting them to 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 either a country close by where they could uh, register or, or you know, sort of give them the lay of the land of when we plan to uh, launch a program in their respective countries. And then in the countries we're already present physically with operations, we obviously have uh, a good marketing communications team, which, I, which I'm a part of and support also in country. And uh, they communicate externally and they sort of do outreach and, and recruit the, the learners. And they do this with, you know, traditional means like social media, but also through press by doing events in which, you know, uh, the, maybe the purpose is to talk about the specific, you know, topic like digital inclusion. But obviously the side, the objective is to recruit learners and to disseminate uh, the, the, the work that we do so more people are interested. So it's a mixture, uh, the way we attract students. 
So, um, quick question, David. In your opinion, what's the future of work? The future, it's a good question, even though it might sound complex. I do have a pretty straightforward answer for it. Uh, not prepared, but I do have it on the top of my mind because I think about this topic quite often. The future of work, the sustainable future of work, it's actually formed the three very basic components. Um, and obviously the, the key role is played by both employers and employees, but I will now, for the purpose of this argument, focus more on employers and what can they do. So first of all is to offer their employees opportunities to upskill and reskill themselves, uh, especially as they want to implement more automation and more technologies that will displace workers to make sure that they offer their employees the chance to, to find a new position within the same company because it's been already proven that the cost of firing somebody and uh, uh, hiring somebody else or even just using uh, an automation software, it's not always the best approach and it's actually on the contrary, you know, creating a lot of potential risks, both a personal human one, obviously for the person who's being fired, but also for the company who's uh, who's now employing maybe robots or automation software, which is again, not the most uh, uh, sustainable practice when it comes to future work that still has humans as a key component of it. So reskilling and upskilling is one element. The other one is employers to be willing to offer flexible work arrangements as a almost like a, a basic uh, you know, part of the job description. So no longer a bonus, but something that everybody should be entitled to. And by remote and flexibility in, in terms of where you choose to work, obviously with the degree of, uh, no, how can I put it? With a with degree of rigidity in the sense that you cannot often just offer your employees to work full time remotely. But as, as we've seen, many companies are now implementing this, this approach of you can work a couple of days from the office and the rest of the days from home. And obviously there's weeks in which you're two weeks at home and you, you know, maybe visiting your home country, so you're at, you, you don't come to the office those two days. So the idea is to offer flexibility, do have some sort of minimum requirements of being in the office every now and then, but have enough flexibility for the employee to feel empowered. And finally, but definitely not the last point of the agenda is um, to, to really create a space at work in which mental health is not uh, something which is a taboo subject, but something which is discussed and, and, you know, the employer helps the employees if they have any challenges due to, you know, workloads or due to stresses in their personal life. Because we spend so much of our living days at work, employers should take more responsibility in the way they impact the, the lives of their employees. And if they don't treat them respectfully, yes, maybe the, the employee will burn out, he or she will leave the job and the sort of burden of helping him or her rehabilitate himself will fall on the next employer. But at the end of the day, society loses and, and it's good for employers to, to take care of their employees and to, you know, respect their mental health issues because they're not a taboo subject. Everybody has some degree of anxiety and stress, which fall under the mental health issues. So it's a mat it's a it's definitely time now to respect this and to address these issues and, and help employees. So these three topics again, reskilling, flexible work arrangements, and and a, a more humane perspective to mental health at work. That's how a sustainable future of work would look like. Well, fantastic. I love the summary. And I don't think I've heard anyone use those three concrete examples or or, or focus points. Right. Uh, different people have different views on it. Now, I have, a, I have a, a little follow up question on this. Right. So in the introduction and the way you describe it is you, you, you're interested in the intersection of education, policy and tech. Right. Where that intersects, if we now apply that to the future of work, how does that look like? Um, it looks like in, in the following ways, and obviously there's different perspectives you can look at it, but I will look at it from a the perspective of what we do at Generation. So we're uh, essentially not an education provider. With We're more than that. We're obviously placing people into jobs, offering them support. We do the whole shebang, uh, for lack of a better word. But let's just look at the educational part, the training part. We're using technology to deliver our trainings now. We've actually moved most of our uh, offline courses to online mode, hybrid mode, obviously nowadays when it's possible, meaning that you know part of the course is taught online, part face-to-face. Um, and we're not going to go back to, to offline fully anytime soon. We actually like this model and our feedback from the from the learners, from our graduates is virtually unchanged in terms of success rates from pre-pandemic times when we did offline. So we have find a way that it works for us and, and technology enables us to do that. And how does policy fit into all of this is to help shape, again, as an NGO, and we're obviously, we have to do a lot more on this topic because we're still at the 
a fairly young NGO. We we are, I think, now eight years, well, ten years old almost, but still uh, fairly young in the bigger scheme of things. To help influence policymakers who, in you know, do maybe sometimes a I wouldn't say a bad job, but definitely a, a more antiquated or outdated job when it comes to designing curricula for education, because that's why we exist generation in a sense, because the current system doesn't really work. So we came along to help, um, you know, offer the, the, the people we help the chance for an education that has a clear goal, not just a certificate that in some cases you never use. It has a clear goal, which is a job at the end, or at least an interview. Obviously, it's still down to the learner to do well in the interview, but we do offer the, the chance. Um, and yeah, policymakers hopefully will work more and more with them to make sure that basically our mission is for generation to no longer need to exist. If you know educational systems and employment systems will work across the world, we would be happy because it means our job is done and there's not going to be a need for our sort of a methodology and embedded system because hopefully in, in some years it will be already embedded in systems across the world and as a parenthesis, we do work at generation more and more now with governments including in singapore a country where where, where you are now based uh, and i think it's 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 a, an incredible government there that really focuses on reskilling and what we've done is we actually work directly with them to help them embed our methodology that has proven successful in so many different geographies to even further the great work that the Singaporean government is doing on reskilling. So we have success stories already with working with governments, but obviously Singapore is quite of a, uh, a rock star when it comes to <laughs> uh, governmental policies to do with reskilling. So a very so, enthusiastic participant. Exactly. So, <laughs> but we do have uh, projects in in pilots with government with the local governments in India, in the UK. So we're expanding more and more, and I think that's the future. You know, to work more with you know with the government that should help such entities and others like generation to really embed their good work in the the, the structure that is already there because most countries have a workforce development system and the education system but it's not usually leveraged quite well and that's why a generation and other such organizations can uh, help the governments be more effective in their policies you know so that's why i like to work at the intersection because they're all connected you know education technology and policy they all need each other and the future belongs to organizations that connect dots between these three areas. Fantastic. So, so you have an educational system, policy around that employment system, policy around that, and then technology to support it all and hopefully streamline that. And then you exactly. can slowly go off in the sunset and focus on something else. <laughs> in an ideal world, yes. But uh, we all know we, we have a lot of work to do for that ideal world to be a reality. So, so what are some of the most... I would say popular training programs that you that you see are actually effective. I mean, maybe the, the wrong question. Popular is maybe not the wrong, uh, not the right question. What's the most successful program? What skills are you basically teaching uh, the learners and are ultimately resulting into sustainable work? It's it's a um, very easy and unsurprising answer is technology related skills because as you really well summarized my argument before technology is literally the the red line connecting all the other uh, dots between education employment and policy and so on so maybe you don't train to be a policymaker or a professor or a uh, I don't know a workforce development agent because maybe that's not your mission in life but most likely if you train uh, in in becoming a technologist you will have something to do. Uh, there, there will be a job for you because there's so many roles now ranging from digital marketeer, which we still put under the technology bracket, to robotic process automation uh, specialist, to cloud administrator. There's just so many options in technology that indeed that's the main industry we're preparing people for, followed closely by the exact opposite maybe of technology in terms of the skills needed, which is healthcare. Because obviously, if in technology, there's a lot of need for, yes, both soft and hard skills, but it's obviously a bit more technical. While in healthcare, it's at least at this moment, the opposite. We, we need people who have empathy, um, we, who have patience, which obviously is needed in technology. But indeed, in healthcare, without those basic uh, and important soft skills, you would not be able to be a good nurse or a good doctor. I don't want to go in that rabbit hole. We've all uh, been treated by doctors who didn't really communicate with us. Uh, that much, but uh, indeed, uh, I would say in the healthcare system, it should be important to have soft skills like empathy, and we're also preparing people it's for healthcare awesome. jobs. So tech and healthcare would be the two industries where that are most popular uh, to answer your question. 
and and we are very deeply embedded into the tech space right and 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 what we hear and actually stats back this up broadly 70 percent of businesses are screaming because of the shortage in tech talent out there right so so you are basically creating supply right rather than you know searching uh, the, the globe for for who's available you're actually building supply and solving two birds uh, hitting two birds with one stone Love it. actually if i can add to it it's more than two birds because uh, the the things that we're very proud of at generation is again this part of inclusivity and especially digital inclusion in tech because as we all know we don't have enough uh, representatives of the minority uh, groups being in tech, not enough women in tech, and we're targeting exactly these this this, this audience. You know, we're training specifically a lot of young women who who never even considered tech as a career, minority groups from across the world, who again were for some reason or the other not really included before in tech, and now we're we're playing a huge role in this. So we're not just helping uh, get more supply for the tech companies, but we're really providing them access to talent which they've previously either disregarded or were not in contact with for some reason. Wow, putting diversity into the mix, not just in the, in the skills, but also the actual individuals um, that are delivering those skills. <laughs> just exactly. beautiful. Now, uh, before generation, uh, David, you uh, I heard that you worked in Google particularly in AI. Can you tell us a little bit about what you, you did there? Um, I didn't work in AI at Google in particular. I worked actually on digital reskilling. So the reskilling uh, oh. element was again my, my main focus. Uh, however, being at Google, which is an AI-driven company, uh, it's indeed a great place to learn more about AI. And I can definitely uh, feel very grateful for the time I spent at Google for learning a lot about AI from the company who's probably leading in terms of AI development in the world. Um, but my role at Google, the first three years was based in my home country in Romania, where I've launched the, the what is even up to this day, the most successful digital reskilling program in, in Romania, for sure, potentially also in East of Europe, which is called Grow with Google globally, but in Romania it's called Atelierul Digital, which uh, targets young uh, uh, people and entrepreneurs uh, to you know help them either further their careers by learning a new digital skill or uh, help them uh, you know, launch a business online. And then in my last year at Google, the fourth one that I've actually spent in Brussels, and that's how I you know, connect the dots between my personal story. I ended up in Brussels because of a great project I was fortunate enough to work for at Google, which was during the 2019 European elections. I was brought in to be a sort of a mix between an educator and a trainer for politicians across the EU, across the European Union, in digital skills. And in this case, what I mean by digital skills was um, training politicians to use tools that Google provides for free to everyone, like Google Trends, YouTube, for the politicians to know how to incorporate online tools to campaign better, to communicate with their constituencies. And the other, I would say, equally important, if not even more important aspect of the, the trainings I delivered was to teach politicians and their teams how important it is to mind their safety online, sort of the mind the gap part, but mind it online because it's, you know, the cybersecurity threats have been increasing over the past few years and now with COVID even more so. And many of the politicians and their teams that I've spoke with, I don't want to be too harsh, but in some cases they were clueless to the risks that they were exposing themselves by having a, a weak password for their Facebook accounts. And it's small things like this that we all do, but if you're a politician, you obviously the role comes with a bit more heat than, than you and I would have, and the potential risks are bigger. So I made sure that I've raised awareness of all the uh, sort of uh, weaknesses that they had in their campaign uh, teams to, to address them, to help them build a better, more uh, safe uh, online uh, campaign and outreach, and to be guarded as much as possible from all the cyber threats that politicians are exposed to nowadays, from from bots to phishing scams to malware to all sorts of things that they are uh, potentially they can fall victim to. So that's the Google connection. Again, AI was an important part of it, but because of my own interest in the topic, it was not directly a part of my role uh, at Google. Uh, understood, understood. And maybe zooming in a little bit, right? So, so let's put healthcare aside. Um, so we, you called it digital reskilling. I'm presuming that if I understood your explanation, it's really technical skills 
that you are creating. Is that correct? Or digital digital skills? Digital skills, because again, we started with digital marketing, something we would call a soft digital skill. And then we did end up teaching people the basics of machine learning, which is a more of a hard digital skill. So both engineering and digital marketing. Understood, understood. So so I guess if you were to off the top of your head, I mean, it's okay if it's not precise or not, not correct broadly, like for the next, let's say two to three years, what are the top three digital skills? that you would highly recommend based on what you have seen, right? And based on all the studies you've done. And this is relevant to us because our listeners also will be, okay, they, they know a couple of skills, but what should they be investing in if they want to be in high demand and extremely relevant in the next couple of years? Yeah, I think the, it's a very good question, but I have the answer that I want to give for the majority of people who maybe still, for good reasons, for personal reasons, don't want to be a programmer, because I think, at least personally for me, it was never something I was I would aspire to do. I like to understand the basics of it, but it's just not fitting my profile. And there's many people, I think, like me, who are just not into programming, and it's okay. It's, we don't all have to be programmers, just because there's a, you know, a, a huge demand now. Uh, maybe they're gonna, there's going to come an AI that will replace programmers. Actually, this is in the making now, as we all probably know. Uh, so anyways, for most people like me, and others who are not keen to become programmers, the basic digital skills that maybe we take for granted sometimes, but still the majority of people don't have to some degree, given that we still have a world in which half of the people are not connected even to the internet, so there's still a lot of work to be done. So basic digital skills like Microsoft Excel, Google, you know, Google tools, uh, using Zoom, using Teams, all sorts of basic tools that we now use more and more, they still are not used globally yet by enough people and, they're, and they're, there's not enough people knowing how to use these basic digital skills and to apply them. So I would have that as a priority for the majority of people to just get their ABCs right when it comes to digital skills. Um, and then for the ones that are pro- passionate about programming and maybe have a, a background in mathematics, statistics and have a passion for it, because passion is very important, I recommend very clearly data analysis, which is, you know, there's going to be just more and more data. That's a given. It's unavoidable and there's going to be a bigger need of both people and software to interpret that data and make use of it. So data analysis courses, jobs will be more and more in demand. Uh, and of, of course, AI is the, the 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 future in the present already. Many of our um, you know day-to-day tools, be it this laptop I'm speaking with you from or the phone are using AI uh, software behind the scenes. So, you know, learning uh, basic uh, code that help you, you know, program AI and work with machine learning and and, and uh, neural nets and so on and so forth is also very important. And finally, the third skill I would say for people who are, again, passionate about programming is cybersecurity. So cybersecurity is, again, a growing uh, in-demand industry and one that will for sure see a huge growth in the coming years. There's, you know, even if you're, you know, your listeners are investors and, and they look at, uh, you know, cybersecurity companies, they've been growing and growing every year for the past 10 years. And when I was young, I only remember two, Norton and Mahak McAfee. Now, there's much more than just Norton and McAfee. And there's a reason for that. There's just more threats and there's a bigger need for AI driven cybersecurity companies to, to help out. So cybersecurity, AI, AI related skills and data analysis, plus the foundation, which is the digital basic digital skills for everybody. These are the uh, the skills I recommend. May, may I make a recommendation? Sure, <laughs> please do. Um, so our vision, at least my vision, um, is that in the near term future, there'll be more solutions built by non-programmers than there will be built by programmers. And by solutions, I mean automated processes mm-hmm. because of the no-code movement, because it is so easy to build stuff now that actually doesn't require you to write a single line of code anymore Mm -hmm. so um i would highly recommend based on my my own passion and how i see the world evolving introduction of no code um i think there's a massive massive space here for for non-programmers non-techies to actually pick up some real basic stuff and have some really cool stuff built stuff built um that that even programmers would struggle to build today so um, I, I agree with that approach. However, indeed, I was thinking a bit more. I almost gave gave you you gave the middle ground, which is great. I gave the extremes, the, the people who have no nothing to do with programming code or anything like that, which is still fine. And the majority of us don't have something to do with code. And the other extreme, which is people. And now I'm, I can give you a concrete example. 
um, Alphabet, the, the mother company uh, or the father company, if you want, has the has DeepMind also. And obviously, if you work at DeepMind, you kind of need to know a bit of code because the, the sort of high level things they're doing there and, you know, avant garde things to, to do with how to use AI to uh, understand the human genome and things like this. You definitely need a, you know, a physics degree or two to understand those things. So in this case, indeed, there's always an, you know, an outlier there, you know, a Steve Jobs and, and somebody who doesn't have anything to do with technology initially who becomes a technologist. But for, for that sort of thing, you probably need data analysis and AI and other tools as well. But as I said, there's a extremes to it and you give the middle ground, which I agree with. It's is there's room for everybody, basically. That's the, the answer that we together formed. <laughs> A good compromise, <laughs> I'd say. Now, from uh, one of my my last questions, actually, from uh, shaping the world with no code, let's uh, talk a bit about the Global Shapers community, David, that you're a part of. Oh, uh, happy to to pr present it a bit. It's a community I, I'm very fond of, and I've been part of. I think now for six years, if I'm not mistaken. It's a community founded by the World Economic Forum, uh, the organization that organizes the, the infamous meeting in Davos every year. And they realized by organizing Davos every year that, you know, initially Davos was just a place for pretty much middle-aged white men, which is something that obviously it's not very representative of today's world. And luckily they realized it in time and they, they have a much more diverse um, list of attendees nowadays that includes a lot more youth than they had before. And part of the reason why is that 10 years ago, if I'm not mistaken, or 11, I think it's the 11th year now that we're going to celebrate this year, um, they, they realized that they need to create a community of young leaders that they sort of support and offer opportunities to. And that's how Professor Schwab, the, the person behind the WEF, created the Global Shapers community. And now we're you know over 10,000 members spread across, I think, close to 500 cities. And the purpose of our of our organization, of our community, is to give back to the society we're in, be it locally, regionally, or globally. And we do that by setting up our own projects voluntarily that tackle, you know, issues ranging from inequality, um, climate change, and how we can, you know, uh, decrease the, the bad effects of global warming, to, to my delight, obviously, the future of work and how we can reskill more people. So we have projects across all aspects uh, that are, you know, challenges or opportunities in today's world. And we do so voluntarily uh, with uh, with no support, actually no financial support from the forum. It's purely us doing fundraising and grassroots actions to to help with these these points I mentioned. So that's a short presentation of, of the community. And maybe before Jackie uh, wraps up for our listeners within Asia specifically, um, Asia and the Pacific, I should say. Um, do if they want to upskill, um, where do they start, and what can they expect? I mean, uh, it really, it really depends. There's so many, so many courses online now that really there's no excuse not to learn. However, I do understand, like for everybody, not just probably the, the people you have in mind, but also maybe us, we have our own experiences of starting a couple of courses and not finishing them because it's indeed pretty difficult if you don't have a mentor or somebody else, a peer group to support you. At least that was my experience. So ideally, uh, they would look for a course that is hybrid, uh, has an online component, but also a chance to get some support or peer, peer you know, connection face to face. Um, and th there's plenty of such opportunities for free across the world now, given by, you know, how education is becoming more and more democratized. Um, and yeah, I, I would recommend Generation, of course, if, if the audience that you have in mind is also fitting our description, which is a vulnerable category that maybe doesn't have even the time and, and money uh, to, for, for another course. Our courses are free. And we also, as, as, as I said, because we're targeting a vulnerable population we offer stipends for food for transport because it's very different different for somebody who's you know living from paycheck to paycheck to take time off to do a course even if it's online and we realized it and that's why we're sort of trying to to cover from for some of these expenses so plenty of opportunities the only prerequisite is the the, the desire to learn and the curiosity to to continuously explore new things because we could have this podcast for hours and still not exhaust you know all the tech related things that are happening now, you know, and, and tech influenced things. And in order to be ahead of the game, you have to keep learning. And that's that's my message basically to keep learning. 
right? Let's keep on learning. Now for businesses or individuals interested in connecting with you, David, where can they best find you or how can they best get in touch with you? I think LinkedIn is a, is a platform that is you know very suitable for both individuals and businesses. And yeah, David Timmis is my name. You can reach out to me and uh, and we can chat there. Super. We'll make sure to also put your LinkedIn uh, details on the in our show notes. So, uh, well, uh, listeners, that's all for today's episode. Loving the theme for today of giving back. I hope some of you have been inspired by David to at least uh, give back in uh, your own uh, special way. Thank you again for listening. And thank you, David, for sharing your story with us today. And, uh, well, we definitely learned a lot. But once again, this is Jacqueline de Menck. And Wouter Tilbare. And stay tuned for the next episode of Mangtas Nation. Thank you for tuning in to Mangtas Nation. Mangtas, your curated marketplace for B2B outsourcing solutions. Follow our social media pages to know more about us. Sign up as a client or sign up as a vendor and be part of this global B2B marketplace. Join us at www.mangtas.com.